Terrence McKenna had a very funny thing that he said about science. He said, science wants you to believe that it's all about measurement and reason if you allow them one miracle. <laughs> that one miracle is the Big Bang. Yes. Okay. That all things come from the most preposterous idea ever. Yeah. That everything came from nothing yeah. in one big miracle. <laughs> That's right. I completely I totally agree paraphrased that. it. Yeah, he I probably that. said it far more well, eloquently. Well, this, but... this was this was Sir Fred Hoyle's objection to the Big Bang. Mm. He was he said he was a, do, a Democritean. He didn't believe. He said nothing comes from nothing, <laughs> and I, I simply refuse to believe that that the physical universe came from nothing physical. And moreover, he said it smacks of the Genesis account, which he detested. And so he rejected the Big Bang and formulated this steady state model. By the way, really quick, that steady state model that he's talking about is the idea of a past eternal universe, which modern science has basically now totally debunked, just context. Um, that was later, I think, decisively refuted by um, the discovery of the cosmic background radiation. His uh, it happens. I've, I've had funny coincidental meetings with Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and Thomas Gold, all three of the, the architects of the steady state mod model. I met Bondi and Hoyle when I was a PhD student in Cambridge. And Hoyle held on to his dying day for the, the steady state. But he, uh, Bondi, uh, uh, actually, we had a conversation about it, and he said that, that well, it turned out that it was a brilliant idea. It was a beautiful idea, just that it turned out that everything about it was wrong, and he, re he rejected <laughs> it. So, uh, but uh, later, Hoyle had his own conversion to a kind of quasi-theistic worldview because of his discovery of the fine-tuning parameters. But the, the, the point is that the materialists did not expect uh, to have this evidence from the beginning. Hoyle thought that, you know, the laws of physics were the, the, the first right. law of uh, right. conservation of matter and energy, uh, and matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed, except at the Big Bang. <laughs> and, mm. so, and he didn't like that, but eventually, I think the physics community came around. There were so many indicators of that beginning event. Now, again, as we're discussing detection methods and our ability to understand things is so radically different from 1920, 100 years ago. What is it going to be like 100 years from now? Is this, they're going to be, I mean, are we making assumptions based on very limited data? It's a lot it's of a data question. for us but it seems fairly limited given the scope of not just this universe, but then the concept of multiverses. Like, what is what are your thoughts of this concept of multiple universes? I love to talk about the multiverse. Or infinite universes. Yeah, I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised it. Uh, and this also, this also connects to uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the Fred Hoyle story, which is fascinating. Um, again, with the proviso, science is necessarily provisional. And we of always have to be open to new, to new data. Right. Um, but um, the trend lines, I think, are the, are the things that are really interesting. Uh, so there's this Hoyle, Hoyle's. Let's start with Hoyle, and then we'll get to multiverse. Okay. So Hoyle is a um, great astrophysicist. He's thinking about carbon, and he realizes that carbon has this unique property of being able to make long chain-like molecules, and long chain-like molecules, and therefore are capable of storing information, and we need information to build specified structures in particular living systems. So he's trying to explain the abundance of carbon in the universe. And he thinks of four or five different ways that won't work, and finally he comes up with a way that would work. And long story short, it turns out for that, that um, way of building carbon chemically to work, it has to do with combining uh, simpler, um, uh, what are called nucleons, uh, smaller atoms to get the carbon molecule. There has to be a special resonance mm. level for the carbon molecule, special way it sings. It has a certain energy level that, that causes it to uh, uh, sing at a certain frequency. Turns out the fr frequency he predicts, which would be necessary to explain the origin of carbon in the universe, uh, exists within a particular form of carbon. And they determine this at Caltech. But then that turns out to be the, 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 the tip of, an, of a deeper iceberg, of a whole series of other things in the universe that would have to be just right to make this formation of carbon possible. The gravitational force would have to, it, when, inside stars, you, the gravity couldn't be too strong, too weak. Its mm -hmm. electromagnetic force couldn't be too strong or too weak. The ratio between them couldn't be too strong or too weak. 
everything fell in this sweet spot, this kind of Goldilocks zone, where um, and we now we now call this the phenomenon of fine tuning. That there are multiple parameters in the universe that fall within these very narrow tolerances, outside of which not only life would be impossible, but stable galaxies and even basic chemistry would be impossible. And so that is to say, even to get the evolutionary process going, you would have to have all these beautifully finely tuned parameters in place. And so Hoyle starts having a rethink about this, and he's a staunch atheist, scientific atheist materialist, but he ends up concluding that fine tuning points hmm. to some kind of a fine tuner. And he's quoted as saying that uh, the best data we have suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry in order to make life possible. And so he moves to this sort of rudimentary theistic position in his, in his philosophy or his worldview. Now, a lot of other f physicists have c come to the same conclusion. Uh, Sir John Polkinghorne, great Cambridge physicist, had a late-in-life conversion, th religious conversion. It was partially predicated on his awareness as a physicist of the evidence for the universe as a setup job, the Goldilocks universe, as some, some physicists have called it. Um, so that's kind of, as Hoyle said, a kind of common sense interpretation. Uh, when we see other systems that are finely tuned, like a French recipe or an internal combustion engine, what we mean by fine tuning is an ensemble of improbable parameters that work together to accomplish right. some remarkable outcome or functional, uh, fu functional or remarkable outcome. That's what if you see an internal combustion engine, you think it was engineered because it's finely tuned. So common sense. The contrary argument to that, the main one, there have been others, but not even most secular physicists regard them as compelling anymore. The main contrary argument has been the idea of the multiverse. That yes, our universe has this array of jointly improbable, for, uh, para uh, improbable parameters that are in that sweet spot. But we just happen to be the lucky one because there's a gabillion other universes out there. And with different combinations of the laws and constants of physics and different initial conditions at the beginning of those universes. So all those things that were just right in our universe are, yes, extremely improbable, but there's so many other universes that, 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 that the probability of a universe hmm. with that set of life-friendly conditions arising somewhere had to arise somewhere, inevitably, and we just happen to be in that lucky universe. And then we are stunned by that, and they call that this observer selection effect. So that's superficially uh, an equally plausible explanation to the fine-tuner argument. And a lot of physicists have told me that they regard the two as a wash. You can believe in a fine-tuner, or you could believe in a multiverse. I think the fine-tuner, uh, the, 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 we'll call it theistic design argument, provides a better overall explanation. In both scenarios, there is a level of faith that is required. We don't have evidence for a multiverse in the way that people would want evidence of God. Atheists want to see some physical manifestation of God, and they, they also don't have that for the multiverse. Rather, what you do is you look at what we can observe, and then you make inferences based on that. So I love the example that he gave of a combustible engine. I love the example that he gave of a of a well-made recipe. You look at the recipe and you infer that there might be a cook that played a role somewhere in this extremely well-designed recipe. You look at a combustible engine, you think there was probably an engineer. You look at a painting like, you know, um, like the Mona Lisa, and you think, you know, I wonder if if there was a painter's handiwork somewhere along the way. Um, you look at the complexity of a computer system and you think maybe there was a designer behind this as well. You look at this universe and its complexity and you and you realize that due to that fine tuning effect, perhaps, just perhaps, that there was actually design that went into this for the same reasons. Or you say, well, wait a second, like he already kind of explained, it. I don't need to rehash it, but maybe we just feel like it's special, but really it's just a numbers game and we're lucky in the multiverse. Both, however, require faith. Neither of those scenarios meets the level of uh, the, the criteria of evidence that atheists want uh, God to be able to bring to the table. Neither can the multiverse theory bring that to the table. So we're left in a place of, of faith at this juncture. But again, in the scenario of there being an intelligent designer, we also have a bedrock for ethics, 
for human rights, for human dignity, for the fact that we actually have things like love that exists, things like thoughts that exist that are immaterial. All of all of these other things begin to make more sense in the context of there being an intelligent designer, i.e. God. What's inconvenient about that is that then you also have this idea of an authority. If there's a personal uh, intelligence above us and who has created the universe, then we're on the hook um, in terms of him being an authority. This is where C.S. Lewis talks about we desire a heavenly grandfather, not a heavenly father. We want someone that gives us presents and scratches our back and gives us all the things that we like, but never asks anything of us and does not ask us to be under their authority in any way. And I really think that that is the rub and the reason that the multiverse theory is more appealing is people, when their hearts are hard against God, simply cannot stand the idea of his authority because that means that they're not God. Um, and so uh, just some things to consider. All this being said, you guys, this was another awesome clip. I love the Rogan, Stephen Meyer mashup. I hope you guys do too. Um, I might try to pull one more out of there. If not, we'll move on to some other good content and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks a lot. Bye.